We do have a, uh, we have three speakers uh, this afternoon, two of whom are with us. The third is uh, alleged to be in a taxi on the way from the Pearson Airport uh, to the hotel here, and uh, we expect him to be here shortly. The third member of our panel is the Honorable Daniel Turp, uh, Member of Parliament, uh, who uh, had to participate this morning in a debate in the House of Commons, and therefore uh, has been slightly delayed, but uh, we anticipate him here shortly. And I will introduce him uh, more fully when he arrives. Uh, my name, by the way, is uh, Patrick Monaghan, and I am a professor at Osgoode Hall Law School and one of the co-chairs of, uh, uh, of this conference, and I will also be speaking uh, in a few moments. But let me introduce uh, our first speaker, and we are very pleased to, to have with us this afternoon Mr. Pierre Bienvenu, uh, who is a partner in the law firm of Ogilvy Renault, practicing in the firm's Montreal office. Uh, he has been with the uh, litigation group of that law firm since 1983, and he is a member of the firm's management committee. He is a graduate of the Faculty of Law of the University of Montreal, and of the London School of Economics and Political Science. He practices commercial arbitration and litigation, competition law, and constitutional law. Of particular interest uh, in relation to today's topic is the fact that in 1996, Mr. Bienvenu was retained by the Government of Canada to represent the Attorney General of Canada in the reference to the Supreme Court of Canada on uh, the unilateral secession of Quebec from Canada. And he's going to speak to us this afternoon about the reference and about the uh, responses to the reference both in Ottawa with federal legislation and the legislation introduced in the National Assembly in the province of Quebec. Pierre. Thank you, Patrick. Dear colleagues, dear friends, I take great pleasure in uh, opening the discussion of the last panel of this year's special lectures devoted to secession. I warned uh, Patrick Monahan a few weeks ago that I was still recovering from minor surgery to the vocal cord, so I apologize in advance if my voice weakens as I approach my conclusion. The legal framework applicable to the possible secession of Quebec from Canada has been the topic of discussion among legal scholars for at least 25 years. Uh, it was in 1976 uh, that Jacques Brossard published uh, his monography, L'Accession à la Souveraineté et le Cas du Québec, Accession to Sovereignty in the Case of Quebec, the second edition of which, uh, that was published in 1995, contains a supplement authored by our soon-to-be co-panelist, Daniel Turp. Uh, the first edition of uh, Peter Hogg's Constitutional Law of Canada uh, also contained a section on uh, secession displaying the legal framework applicable to secession. A referendum on sovereignty association took place in 1980 in Quebec, but renewed interest for this issue seemed only to resurface in the early 90s when a number of commentators, law professors, practitioners, political scientists, began to question uh, whether people's right to self-determination at international law, a right which had often uh, been invoked by sovereignist, sovereignist politicians, did indeed offer a, a legal basis to secession, in other words, a right to independence. Uh, all others also engaged in debating whether the democratic principle uh, might offer a legal basis uh, for secession. Now, I think it is fair to say that the discussion of these issues took a radical turn in the mid-1990s when the government of Quebec, led by Mr. Parizeau, tabled two bills uh, in connection with the uh, 1995 forthcoming uh, referendum, both of which at least contemplated a unilateral declaration of independence, or UDI. Uh, proceedings were instituted by Mr. Guy Bertrand in August 1995 to challenge the legality of the Quebec government's proposed process for the accession of Quebec to sovereignty, 
and the rest, I am tempted to say, is too recent history for one to recount. The aftermath of the Supreme Court's opinion in the secession reference, beyond the uh, main protagonist's initial reaction and beyond the publication of very learned commentaries on the decision, has centered on the federal government's response to the reference in the form of the Clarity Act. And that federal initiative, in turn, has prompted indignant denunciations from the government of Quebec, from a number of opinion leaders in Quebec, as well as the introduction in the National Assembly of Quebec of a bill, Bill 99, which embodies the Quebec government's response to the Clarity Act. And it is, of course, the uh, Supreme Court's requirement of clarity that has been the focus uh, both of the federal bill and of the surrounding debate. That was true at least until very recently because the current uh, Senate hearings have somewhat broadened the debate. The first point that I thought useful to make in respect of clarity is that it was not a distinct issue in the secession reference. Neither the questions put to the court nor the submissions made by the key players in the reference addressed the question of the requisite conditions for a referendum to yield a reliable expression of a democratic will to secede. Now you may ask, uh, how then was the court brought to formulate requirements of clarity? I think a logical and uncontroversial answer is that having held that the expression of a democratic will by the population of Quebec to secede from Canada would place a constitutional obligation on the rest of Canada to negotiate a constitutional amendment, the court felt it necessary at least to identify the circumstances in which this obligation would arise. Now, a perhaps more controversial answer consists in speculating that the court's preoccupation with clarity was somehow a reflection on past experience in Canada, particularly uh, the 1980 and 1995 referendums held in Quebec. But whatever the reasons for the court's preoccupation with this issue, the court's insistence on clarity is undeniable, and the requirements of clarity must henceforth be considered by all parties co to confederation as a necessary precondition to the constitutional obligation to negotiate the secession of the province from Canada. Now, what are those requirements? A clear question, a clear majority to be evaluated qualitatively, and the holding that it will be for the political actors, not for the courts, to determine what constitutes a clear majority on a clear question. I don't think much justification uh, need be given for the court's requirement of a clear question. Fairness in the wording of a referendum question inheres in the legitimacy of a referendum as a consultative device. And I've tried to illustrate in my paper that this concern is not unique to the Canadian experience. Now, some have sought to dismiss concerns about this issue on the basis that following a referendum campaign, voters are well aware of the different options and often do not even bother reading the question. Now, even if that were true, it certainly offers, in my view, no justification for posing an unclear question. But in any event, the little empirical evidence I have found suggests that that proposition is ill-founded. There appears to be voter confusion when there's a debate as to what a proposal means and there's evidence that significant numbers of people vote in ways inconsistent with their preference on a given issue. Now, a very interesting example of the requirement of a clear question can be found in a 1987 decision by the French Conseil Constitutionnel, France's highest constitutional court, dealing with the question proposed for the 1987 referendum on the possible secession of New Caledonia from France. The court held that the proposed question was unconstitutional because it did not meet what the court described, and I quote, 
as the double requirement of fairness and clarity of the consultation. The proposed question read as follows. Do you want New Caledonia to become independent or to remain within the French Republic with a status, the essential elements of which have been brought to your attention? And voters were given a choice of responding, I want New Caledonia to become independent or I want New Caledonia to remain within the French Republic. Conseil Constitutionnel found the referendum question to be objectionable and constitutionally invalid because the words in the last clause of the question could give rise to the erroneous impression that the essential elements of the alternative status alluded to in the question were already in existence, whereas in fact such status was to be determined after the consultation. I have quoted in my paper at page 14 the 1995 referendum question and I say with considerable embarrassment that there is a typographical mistake in the version of my paper that was distributed to you. The question read as follows. Do you agree that Quebec should become sovereign after having made a formal offer to Canada for a new economic and political, not social, political partnership within the scope of the bill respecting the future of Quebec and of the agreement signed on June 12, 1995? Now, there is, in my view, an obvious analogy to be drawn between this question and the one that was struck down by the French Conseil Constitutionnel. Because reading the question, it is apparent that voters were presented not with two, but with three options. One was the status quo. Two was an undefined new partnership in the event that the rest of Canada accepted the offer for a new economic and political partnership. And three was secession in the event the offer for partnership were refused and the government proceeded with a UDI. And I would uh, suggest that there's serious doubt that the 1995 referendum question uh, would meet the requirement later formulated by the court in the secession reference. I turn to the requirement of a clear majority. I offer in my paper uh, the example of a number of referendums which illustrate that what may be legally or what may be quantitatively a majority may well not be a sufficient, uh, may not well be a sufficient or a legitimate uh, expression of popular will so as to justify government action. Relevant factors include a slim or a narrow majority, a low rate of voter participation, possible boycotts by large or by relevant societal groups. The first example I offer is that of the federal liquor prohibition referendum of 1898. In that national referendum, prohibition was approved by a narrow majority of 51%, and only 44% of eligible voters cast a ballot. In the province of Quebec, the results were overwhelmingly against prohibition by a ratio of five to one. For the federal government to have acted on the basis of this referendum result as an expression of majority will would have meant, in the case of the province of Quebec, imposing the will of 25% of the electorate on the province that had voted 83% against the prohibition option. In the result, the Laurier government did not consider the referendum result sufficient to implement national legislation, and the matter was left to the provinces. Another example uh, where a majority vote was considered non-conclusive is the 1987 referendum held in New Caledonia, of which I've spoken a minute ago. New Caledonia is an overseas territory of France, which has had an active independent movement. And in that case, the sovereignist, the Kana, had taken the position that the vote should be restricted to exclude the significant contingent of recent migrants that had come to the island to exploit its nickel deposits. And as a consequence, the sovereignist decided to boycott the referendum. Now, in that case, although the independence option was rejected by 98% of the votes cast, only 59% of the electorate cast a ballot. Shortly thereafter, violence, bro violence broke out 
and the promise of a future referendum had to be included in the political agreement which the uh, sovereignist and the government uh, arrived to to quell the violence. Now, a third example is the uh, 1946 referendum held in the Faroe Islands, also called the Sheep Islands, on their possible secession from Denmark. In that case, secession was approved by the slightest of majorities, 50.1%, and voter participation was 66%. The result was never acted upon, although the islands have enjoyed lo local autonomy since 1948. Now, it will be quite correctly pointed out that voter participation has not been a problem in the context of Canadian referendums on constitutional change. And indeed, the voter turnout for the 1995 referendum in Quebec was extraordinarily high at more than 93%. But I think it is possible to conceive of scenarios in which concerns might arise. It could well be, for example, that a number of Quebecers on both sides of the issue could refrain from voting in a future referendum on secession to express frustration with a government's decision to hold a third or a fourth referendum on secession in a relatively short period. I think one may also question whether a very narrow majority would meet the requirement of clarity if, for example, the support expressed by that majority were demonstrably circumstantial. For example, if it were clearly the product of temporary conditions that a provincial government had succeeded in exploiting. And I comment in passing that I find surprising and deplorable that the concept of winning conditions was allowed to enter the lexicon of political discourse in Quebec without being denounced as inconsistent with the very purpose of a referendum on secession, which is to consult the population on a proposal that is, for all intent and purposes, irreversible. I also give the example of voting irregularities as a relevant factor to assess popular support for secession, and I cite the 1995 referendum where the rejected ballots in number exceeded the margin of the winning option. So I would suggest that a quantitative majority, depending on the circumstances, may well constitute an ambiguous expression of popular will or otherwise lack in legitimacy. I think that the debate as to the assessment by the relevant political actors of whether a ref referendum on secession yields a clear majority should not focus only on numerical requirements or quantitative standards. I turn to the Federal Clarity Act and the uh, Quebec's response, Bill 99. I'll be brief on the Clarity Act because Professor Monahan's paper uh, has devoted uh, in large part to summarizing the objections that have been raised to the Federal Bill and to putting forward the argument in favor of its validity and also in favor of uh, its appropriateness as a response to the reference. So I'll limit myself to perhaps expressing my own point of view, and uh, maybe that will assist in uh, generating a discussion. I start by insisting on the distinction between the rules which a government sponsoring a referendum may adopt, both as to the wording of the question and the support which must be achieved by the winning option, as the uh, Quebec government has done in the Referendum Act and proposes to do in Bill 99 in respect of the majority, on the one hand, and a second set of distinct legal norms which bind other governments in connection with their possible response to the result of this referendum. Now, these norms may find their source in the Constitution, as it was interpreted in the secession reference, or indeed in legislation, such as the Clarity Act. And I highlight the distinction because the Quebec government's reaction to the Clarity Act has tended to confuse the two, no doubt because the government dreads the influence, the indirect influence that the Clarity Act may have on the wording of the question or on the support required for there to arise a constitutional obligation to negotiate. 
must, one must also uh, distinguish arguments directed to the validity of the act, and they concern mainly its consistency with the uh, reference, and those arguments which relate to the appropriateness of the federal bill as a response to the reference. I believe that the Clarity Act is respectful of the court's opinion, and I believe that it is valid federal legislation. Now, as to the basis for this legislation, I would have thought that the residual power of the federal governments to legislate for the peace, order, and good government of Canada would be an obvious candidate to support this legislation. I read that Professor Monaghan has pointed to <coughs> Section 44, the unilateral procedure to amend the Constitution in relation to the executive government. That may also uh, be a candidate. Now, it is said that the federal bill constitutes an invalid or an in inappropriate interference in an area of provincial ju jurisdiction. I disagree with that proposition. The National Assembly continues to enjoy the right to consult the population of Quebec whenever it chooses to do so, using whatever question it deems appropriate. The National Assembly is also entitled, for its own purposes, to decide what level of support is required for an option to be considered the winning option under provincial legislation, subject, of course, to respecting the consultative nature of referendums. As for the federal government and the other provincial political actors, they are duty-bound by the court's opinion to make their own determination of whether the clarity requirements have been met before commencing negotiations on secession. And that is when the Clarity Act comes into play. It's concerned with putting in place a process for these political determinations so as to shape the federal government's eventual response to such a referendum. If the government of Quebec, as Premier Bouchard has declared, agrees with the requirement of a clear question, I think it should seek to build a consensus both within the National Assembly and in dealing with political actors from the rest of Canada as to what would be a clear future referendum question. And I can conceive of no valid objection to submitting uh, to the National Assembly a question which all interested parties have previously acknowledged to be fair and clear. As for the question of the level of popular support that ought to be required before a province can seek to negotiate secession, it is a difficult question. I think we should welcome the debate that the court's opinion and that the federal recent uh, legislative initiative uh, has generated. I do believe that even if a quantitative standard were ultimately agreed upon, be it a majority of valid votes cast, majority of eligible voters, or even some higher threshold. It cannot serve to dispense with the qualitative assessment required of the political actors after the referendum has taken place. And that is why I support the distinction made in the federal bill between the assessment of the clarity of the question which I believe should be made at the earliest possible time so as to disclose in advance of a referendum whether the question is considered clear or not, and the assessment of the existence of a clear majority, which, as I've tried to show, uh, must take into account not only whether an agreed upon quantitative standard has been met, but also whether such factors as voter turnout, electoral irregularities, or other factors may come into play. Now, I make only two or three brief uh, observations on Bill 99. The first one relates to the Quebec government's decision to react to a federal bill which it claims is constitutionally invalid, not by declaring its intention to challenge the bill before the courts, but by adopting competing retaliatory legislation. And it is uh, too early to tell uh, whether the government of Quebec will indeed challenge the Clarity Act in addition to enacting uh, Bill 99. But I fear that if it does not, uh, that would signal a return to a very worrying course of conduct which we have seen displayed by the Attorney General of Quebec in the Bertrand litigation, 
I remind you that in that case, having expressed the view that the judgment of Mr. Justice Pigeon was ill-founded, the Attorney General of Quebec nevertheless declared that it would neither appeal from the judgment nor continue to participate in the proceedings. I don't think that an Attorney General should boycott the courts because it has lost a motion to dismiss proceedings taken against him. The second comment is that Bill 99 seems primarily concerned with expressing Quebec's response, uh, Quebec's political response to the Clarity Act, and I think that to that extent it engages in the sort of political actors dialogue that the uh, secession, uh, that the opinion in the secession reference contemplates. I will say that the uh, original version of Bill 99 uh, was, in my opinion, highly, highly vulnerable to a legal challenge. Uh, in its original <coughs> version, the bill sought to give paramountcy to the provisions of Bill 99 over any other source of legal norms relevant to the possible secession of Quebec, including those set out in the secession reference. Uh, I point also to Section 7 of the original version of Bill 99 as another pr provision which was uh, uh, highly suspect uh, with its bold statement that Quebec was free to adhere to any treaty and to, and to transact with foreign states. As for the reprinted version of Bill 99, I think its validity, should it become law, will depend on the court's willingness, but also on the court's ability to read down its provisions so as to make them consistent with the Constitution of Canada. Now, already, uh, there are many factors, including some statements of the minister sponsoring this bill, which would support the conclusion that the bill seeks to reject the legal framework defined by the court in the secession reference. And indeed, the opinion in the reference is uh, relegated in the preamble of the reprinted version of Bill 99 to an advisory opinion of which the Quebec government merely recognizes the political importance. I conclude by saying that a very important message of the secession reference is that a province may not pursue secession in disregard of the competing rights, interests, and aspirations of others. And these others include not only those who oppose secession within the province, as well as the province's linguistic minorities, Aboriginal peoples, but also the rest of Canada. And I think that the clarity requirements make the point that those rights, those interests, and those aspirations are also at issue when the population of a province is invited in a referendum to consider secession as an option for its future. My last thought is that the vigorous debate that has surrounded the reference and uh, that has surrounded and continues to surround the political actor's response to the court's opinion has not only assisted in clarifying the legal position, but it also has had immense pedagog pedagogical value uh, for Quebecers and other Canadians. And I think that to that extent, uh, this debate, uh, much as it is controversial and draining, is one that ultimately enhances the democratic process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre. Um, we are still awaiting our third speaker, but I uh, am very confident that he will appear. And if he doesn't, you'll have to listen to me for a bit longer, so that would certainly not be uh, to the benefit of, uh, of anyone here. Uh, I do have uh, a set of slides. I have a paper, but I've also prepared a set of slides, and those, there's a hard copy of the slides that I'm going to be using at tab 18 in your binder. So at tab 18, there is the First, a written paper, but then at the end or the conclusion of that paper uh, are the slides that I'm going to rely on uh, this afternoon. Just by way of introduction, 
uh, as Pierre has outlined and as everyone is aware, uh, the Supreme Court decision set out the legal framework for secession and the one of the key elements of the court's judgment was the uh, points that Pierre has mentioned, namely the Supreme Court stressed the need for the clarity of the question and also uh, stated that the result of a future referendum would also have to be clear. Now just as an aside, Pierre mentioned that that had not been the focus of any of these submissions at the Supreme Court of Canada and indeed there was no reference in the reference questions to the idea of clarity. And we could go farther than that and note that in fact there were no submissions made to the court on the issue of a duty to negotiate. That was never mentioned or discussed in any of the submissions uh, at the Supreme Court of Canada. The amicus curiae who was appointed to argue the position of the government of Quebec or on behalf of the opposite position to the position of the Attorney General because the government of Quebec refused to participate uh, did not make any arguments about a duty to negotiate. There was no discussion uh, in any of the submissions to the court so it was a somewhat of a surprise uh, when we uh, opened the court's judgment I participated uh, as co-counsel with one of the interveners Mr. Guy Bertrand at the Supreme Court. It was a uh, certainly a surprise to read uh, the extended discussion on the duty to negotiate and as well then this led the court to, fr to formulate these requirements that there be a clear question and a clear majority. Now one thing the court did say however is that the definition of these terms clear majority and clear question should be left to the political actors. They said it's the obligation of the political actors to define the meaning of these terms and the courts they said would not supervise these political uh, aspects of negotiations. Now the secession reference has been described as the most important decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in constitutional matters and there is every indication that that may well be true but not only because of what the court said about the issue of secession but rather and also for the methodology that is appropriate in constitutional cases and in particular the concept of the use of unwritten constitutional principles, a point that David Segeus mentioned uh, this morning in, in his remarks. So in what I am going to talk about this afternoon I first want to spend some time talking about this issue. When is it appropriate, in fact, to rely on unwritten constitutional principles? And I'm going to talk about the way in which the lower courts have interpreted the Supreme Court of Canada's uh, wording and, and statements on that and some of the difficulties that the courts of appeal uh, in the various provinces and the Federal Court of Appeal have had. I'm going to talk about that for a little while. I'm also going to talk about the elements of this legal framework for secession as set out by the Supreme Court of Canada. And then finally, I also want to look at the Clarity Act, Bill C-20, and ask whether it reflects the Supreme Court's opinion and whether it's consistent with the federal principle. First of all, unwritten constitutional principles. If you look at the Supreme Court of Canada's judgment and try to follow closely through the reasoning, what you see the Supreme Court is saying is that it was appropriate in that case to have regard to unwritten constitutional principles. And they said there were four basic unwritten constitutional principles, but they relied on two of those principles in that case, federalism and democracy. And they said it was appropriate because there was a gap in the Constitution. They said where the Constitution has a gap, we can look to these unwritten constitutional principles. Well, you say, well, what is the gap in this instance? Why is there a gap? And if you read what the court says, they say, well, there is a gap because the Constitution makes no express provision for the legal effect of a referendum on secession. There's nothing in the Constitution dealing with that. 
And there's a gap, therefore, in the Constitution. Now, interestingly enough, and we'll talk about this in a, I'll talk about this in a moment, they did not say that secession itself is outside of the Constitution. They held quite clearly that secession is encompassed within the amending formula, Part 5 of the Constitution Act of 1982. They said even though there was no express reference to secession, that was included within that framework, although they didn't specify which of the various amending procedures would apply in the case of secession. But they said there's no reference there to the legal effect of a referendum. And therefore, they said, we can then have resort to these unwritten constitutional principles. And we will say, therefore, that if there were a clear result in a clear referendum, that would give rise to a constitutional obligation to negotiate the terms of secession and the manner in which secession might occur as a result of that uh, referendum result. Now, what can we say about this approach? I think we can say that this approach is clearly, in my view, unsatisfactory. It is unsatisfactory to say that where we find a gap in the Constitution, we can rely on unwritten constitutional principles. And the reason for that is that the Constitution provides only a bare framework for the operation of political institutions. The Constitution, in other words, is full of gaps. It's intentionally full of gaps. It's only there to establish a skeleton or framework for the operation of ordinary political debate. So that, for example, the Constitution is silent on many things, such as the legal effects of referendums. There's nothing in the Constitution giving legal effect to a referendum, right? That's the Constitution is silent on that, as the Supreme Court noted in the secession reference. It's also silent on property rights, right? There's nothing in the Constitution. Section 7, for example, doesn't have anything on property rights, doesn't have anything on contract rights. So there's a gap, or there could equally well be said to be a gap in the Constitution. What about the binding effect of political promises? There's nothing in the Constitution that says if the Prime Minister promises to abolish the GST, that the Prime Minister, if he breaches that promise, is liable for breach of the Constitution. The Constitution is completely silent on that. Now, as lawyers, we would say, well, that means there's no constitutional right. And that would be our normal conclusion. We'd say, well, the Constitution is silent for a reason because it doesn't believe that in those circumstances, where the Prime Minister has promised to abolish the GST, and he fails to abolish the GST, let's say hypothetically, if a, such a Prime Minister did promise that and failed to deliver on that, <laughs> there would be no cause of action, there would be no breach of the Constitution. That would be our conclusion. And so, until the secession reference, we would have said that's an easy case. You would have brought, if anyone had brought a, if you brought a statement of claim, filed a statement of claim, it would be dismissed. Uh, on a summary basis. But the secession reference gives rise to this possibility then of saying that because the Constitution is silent, we can then find these, these unwritten constitutional principles. And the difficulties with this approach are illustrated by the decision of the Divisional Court of the Ontario Superior Court in a decision handed down in November of 1999, a case called Lalonde versus Ontario, which dealt with the reduction of services at the Montfort Hospital, which is the only French language uh, hospital in eastern Ontario. And what the divisional court there said was, well, there's a gap here. There's nothing in the Constitution guaranteeing the ac access to medical services in the minority language. It's just like our GST example. There's nothing in the Constitution about the GST and there's no, about the Prime Minister keeping promises, and there's nothing in the Constitution about the access to medical services. But rather than conclude, therefore, there's no cause of action, the Divisional Court says, no, we can look to a gap. We can see a gap in the Constitution, and we can now resort to these unwritten constitutional principles. And in this case, there's an unwritten constitutional principle which is the protection of minority rights. And the Divisional Court says that access to medical services is important 
to protect minority rights. It's part of the minority community, very important to the minority community to have access to medical services in French, to the preservation and defense of that minority. And therefore, the reduction of the French language services at the Montfort Hospital violates the principle of guarantee for minority rights. Well, that treats, in effect, that is a, I think, a logical outgrowth of the methodology in the secession reference. Now, that case is under appeal to the Court of Appeal, and we don't know what the Ontario Court of Appeal will say about that. But if we look at how other courts of appeal have interpreted and applied the secession reference, because the secession reference has given a lot of ammunition to litigants now to rely on unwritten constitutional principles, courts of appeal have tended to hold that unwritten constitutional principles, in fact, cannot be used to strike down legislation. And David Segeus this morning mentioned a couple of those cases. One of them is the Bacon case, decided by the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal in May of last year. Second case is the, that, the Bacon case involved the, these farmers and this crop insurance program, and with the provisions of that scheme were changed by legislation and the, uh, there was no cause of action, or a cause of action was denied by statute for breach of, uh, for changing those terms. The Federal Court of Appeal in the Westergaard Thorpe case, that was the APEC case involving the Canada Evidence Act and the provision in the Canada Evidence Act that says that you may not uh, review a uh, denial of documents that contain cabinet confidences. And uh, also the Newfoundland Court of Appeal in the Hogan case, which is a case decided in February of this year, in which the, Fed, the Newfoundland Court of Appeal dismissed a challenge to an amendment to Term 17 of the Newfoundland Terms of Union. And that was challenged in the Newfoundland case in Hogan on the basis of the guarantee of minority rights. In both Bacon and Westergaard Thorpe, the challenge was based on the principle of the rule of law. And what these courts have said essentially is, you can't use unwritten principles. The Supreme Court of Canada couldn't have meant that you can use unwritten constitutional principles to strike down legislation. And I suppose that David Segeus would be very happy if the Supreme Court of Canada adopted that, because that would make his task much simpler. Uh, because now uh, he wouldn't have to worry about the unwritten constitutional principles. The difficulty, as I think he acknowledged in his paper, is whether, in fact, this approach is, in fact, consistent with Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence on unwritten constitutional principles, because not only do we have the secession reference, but we have the provincial court judges reference in 1997. And the clear implication, it seems to me, of those cases is that unwritten constitutional principles, in fact, can be used to strike down legislation. Although in the provincial court judge's reference, they relied on section 11D of the charter, Chief Justice Lemaire's opinion, I think clearly suggests that in an appropriate case, an unwritten constitutional principle can be used to strike down legislation. Let me suggest an alternative approach for the use of unwritten constitutional principles, a necessary implication approach which is to say, rather than say we can use unwritten constitutional principles where there's a gap, we say, or we could say that these principles may be used only where they are necessarily implied by the written text, by a provision or provisions or set of provisions in the written constitution. And I see, just as I predicted, my friend and colleague, Mr. Turp, has arrived. And Daniel, please come and join us uh, here which will allow me to uh, move much more quickly through my uh, remaining remarks here. The implicit principles would be those that flow, as I've said here in this slide, logically or of necessity from the terms of the written text. So that in these circumstances, courts are not creating new principles or new rights, but they're merely giving proper effect to the terms or provisions of the existing constitution. Now, I referred you earlier to the Hogan case. In fact, if you look at the Hogan case, the Court of Appeal, they advanced two different theories. One was the theory of the Bacon case. They, they, they say, we adopt the approach of the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal in Bacon. But in the alternative, or we had at the end of their reasoning, they said that another reason why 
we do not think that unwritten constitutional principles can be used here is that uh, there is no need to rely on unwritten constitutional principles to give proper effect to term 17. Term 17, they said, was a complete code codifying the rights to minority education, and therefore there was no need to look to unwritten principles to give effect to those provisions, and therefore the challenge uh, was rejected. And I think we can see this also as the theory of the Supreme Court of Canada in the provincial judge's reference itself, because in that case, Chief Justice Lemaire, and I've got a quote there on this particular slide, said that the unwritten constitutional principle of judicial independence was necessary in order to give effect to the underlying logic of the act, to give it the force of law. And that's quite a different approach than simply saying something is not provided for under the written constitution. So concluding on this point then, it seems to me we can say that only the necessary implication theory is compatible with the judicial role. The Supreme Court of Canada should clearly adopt that theory as the basis for uh, its future discussion of unwritten principles. Turning to the secession reference itself, in my paper I have outlined, in fact, 10 different elements of the Supreme Court's judgment on secession. I'm not going to go through all of those elements. I'm just going to summarize some of the key elements here. First, they do say unilateral secession is unlawful. Secondly, they do say that secession requires a constitutional amendment. Thirdly, they say there would be a duty to negotiate secession if a clear majority voted on a clear question to secede. Fourthly, the parties to that negotiation would include the government of Canada, governments of the other provinces, and possibly other participants. Those are not defined. There's a reference at a couple of points to other participants. Fifthly, no one party can dictate to the others what is to be negotiated or the outcome of those negotiations. And finally, the courts will not supervise the political aspects of those negotiations. So that last point, it's already been discussed by Pierre, the court has said that the definition of a clear majority or a clear question is the matter for the political process. And I believe that it is very important to attempt to clarify this process in advance of another referendum, if indeed there is going to be another referendum. I believe it is wrong and it is unwise to try to make up rules as we go along, because that's not the way we conduct business in a country dedicated to the rule of law. You don't wait until a legal situation arises so you're in the midst of a dispute to say, well, now let's try and devise a set of rules as to how we resolve our disputes. We say in advance, these are sets of rules that we believe to be fair and appropriate so that uh, when a dispute arises, we have a process in place. And I've concluded, having thought about this, that the only effective way to bind the federal government is through legislation. Because if we do not bind the government through legislation, uh, then we leave the government really without an anchor, without a reference point in the context of a future referendum campaign, which would be a very politicized process. So Bill C-20, which is currently before the Senate, has been passed the House of Commons in March, is now at committee in the Senate, and uh, is the matter of a very serious and strenuous debate before senators, has a couple of elements. Very simple bill, only includes three sections. First, the House of Commons is required to make a determination as to whether a referendum question is clear. It has to do that within 30 days of the tabling of a referendum question on secession. And the House is required to take into account certain views, and I've identified them here. For example, all of the political parties in the Legislative Assembly of the province proposing secession, has to take account of the other provinces, has to take account of the Senate and of Aboriginal organizations. And the questions that were asked in the last two 
referendums in 1980 and 1995 are deemed to be unclear because of a formula that's set out in the bill. Then, if there is a referendum, Section 2 of the bill says that the House of Commons is required to determine whether the majority is clear, and the House is required to take account of these same political actors and their views, and of a number of other factors. Unfortunately, however, on this point, the bill doesn't really provide us with any benchmark. It doesn't establish what might constitute a clear majority. So really, it leaves it to the discretion of a future government to determine what might be a clear majority. I think that's a serious deficiency. Now, Pierre has already mentioned, and I agree, and I expect Daniel will take a different view, but my own view is that this bill is not an intrusion into provincial jurisdiction. It has been challenged on that basis very vigorously at the House of Commons and in the Quebec National Assembly. It's been challenged, and some commentators have said that it is entirely illegitimate. Others have said, such as Claude Ryan, that it may be that the House of Commons might be able to proclaim a, a view of whether the question is clear, but it can only do that after the referendum. Certainly it couldn't do that during the referendum itself. And my own view is that these objections are unfounded for the simple view that the reason that the legislation merely limits the prerogative of the federal government to commence negotiations. Because what the legislation says is that the Crown may not enter into negotiations unless the House of Commons makes these determinations and the Crown may not uh, proceed with an amendment unless there's a clear result in a referendum. And I would have thought that it is clear, as clear as anything can be, that Parliament may bind through statute the federal Crown and that provinces do not operate in hermetically sealed environments. That means that where the federal government takes action or where parliament takes action that's within its jurisdiction, as this is, it may have incidental effects on the provinces and vice versa. The provinces may take action that incidentally affects other provinces or the federal government or the federal parliament. And if it is conceded that federal actors may comment after the vote, it must follow as well that they can comment before the vote, because that should be, that's a political question, that's not a legal determination, that's something that's uh, for them to decide, and it's appropriate, in fact, for Quebec voters to know in advance how the government of Canada regards that question. Now, I'll just deal briefly with this second issue, which is that the senators, particularly Senator Joyal in the Senate, have argued from the opposite perspective that the bill is invalid because it recognizes the divisibility of Canada. And I think the simple answer to this is that the Supreme Court of Canada has determined that Canada is divisible, and this is also the best and the wisest policy for Canada because uh, we should not try to keep any province or region in Canada against its will. And therefore, Bill C-20 is appropriate because it's merely regulating the process whereby secession could occur. One final point as well is that senators have complained about the fact that the bill only requires the House of Commons and not the Senate to make a finding as to whether the question is clear or whether there is a clear majority. I believe, and I think most Canadians do, that it is appropriate that these matters be determined at the federal level by the elected members of the Parliament of Canada and an unreformed and unelected Senate should not have a determining role. Just by way of conclusion then, I think we see that the Supreme Court of Canada decision clarifies certain aspects of the legal framework but emphasizes the primary role of the political actors in clarifying that framework. Bill C-20 goes some ways towards clarifying the determination of a clear question. It does not materially clarify what would be a clear majority, and I think that is a question that will require further attention.
So thank you very much. Those are my uh, remarks. I now did want to introduce Daniel and just take a moment to introduce our third speaker, the Honorable Daniel Turp, who is a member of Parliament for the riding of Boharnois Salaberry uh, in the province of Quebec, and he has and has been the Bloc Québécois foreign affairs critic uh, between 1997 and 1999, and is now the intergovernmental affairs critic. Uh, Professor Turp is also on leave from the Faculty of Law at the University of Montreal, where he has taught both international and constitutional law, and he has written extensively as an academic uh, and, a, and very serious work and very scholarly work and important work on uh, the uh, secession of Quebec and the legal framework and the political framework surrounding that. So we're very pleased to have with us today uh, Daniel Turp. Thank you very much, Patrick. I, I'm very happy to be here, although it was difficult to get here. Uh, and uh, for one reason, I was in, in the House this morning uh, discussing another bill. But that was a bit easier than C-20. It was C-19, this uh, bill uh, that uh, uh, is a bill which uh, implements the uh, Rome Statute on the uh, International Criminal Court. Uh, and it was a very probably interesting and experience in, in uh, legislative uh, drafting because uh, there was a, a real sense that we were doing something together and we were agreeing on something and improving a bill. And I, I hopefully uh, when you see the bill and one day uh, have to apply it to uh, argue before the courts that uh, some former head of state like Monsieur Pinochet, if he ever ends up being in, on this land, that you might be able to, to prosecute him here and make sure that uh, these grave crimes under international law are not left unpunished. But I'm not here to talk about Bill C-19. Uh, uh, I've been asked to talk about the Quebec secession reference, and uh, like Patrick just did it, I'd, I'd like to link it to some extent to, the, to Bill C-20. Uh, and comment a bit on, on the bill and what I, I believe it, it is and what it does and what it can do for, for the future. But just let me make one comment on, on your paper, Patrick, because I had time to read your paper. Uh, and I guess lectures like this can be very useful in, in terms of uh, updating our knowledge on, the, on constitutional law and uh, its development. The whole part on, on principles, on the use of principles and the importance or the growing importance of principles as sources of uh, uh, obligations and, and rules under co Canadian constitutional law is, I, I agree with you, a bit worrying in terms of you know, having judges making, making the Constitution and without any real input on the le constituant, on those who under the Constitution do uh, have the authority to adopt constitution, constitutional amendments. Uh, but, you know, as an international lawyer, I was very fascinated by the fact that the, what's happening in Canadian constitutional law is very similar to what has happened in, in international law, where you have as sources of international law treaties, custom, and general principles of law. And general principles of law in international law are seen as those principles that will allow you to uh, close the gaps in international law. And obviously, the Supreme Court of Canada uh, sees these principles as, you know, a way to, to close some gaps. Uh, and uh, although gaps might not or should not be closed by, by courts, uh, that necessarily implication theory might uh, or should prevail in, in the forthcoming case law of the Supreme Court, it's still very interesting that uh, the court has, has used this notion of uh, general principles or constitutional principles to, to fill the gaps in, in Canadian constitutional law. It's very similar to what has the International Court of Justice and other bodies have done uh, in, in the area of, of international law. So I, I look forward to the developments of the Supreme Court and maybe they'll want to look at what international tribunals have done in determining what was the exact role of principles in lawmaking uh, in a Canadian constitutional context.
but let's come back to, uh, to uh, the Quebec session reference and, and Bill uh, C20. If you want, in the question period, I could tell you what I, I think of what the debate that went on in the House of Commons and the legislative committee I was a member of uh, when we dealt with Bill C20, or uh, what has happened is still happening in uh, the Senate. I think the Senate again today was, was holding some hearings. I uh, heard Patrick, I was there uh, one Monday night, uh, he struggled with questions of, of uh, Senator Joyal, but I must admit I was in agreement with him when he answered uh, and suggested that Canada wasn't indivisible. Well, Patrick, I agreed with that. <laughs> you made a very good point there. <laughs> but you know, I, I was thinking of, of, of Patrick as, as uh, Someone who can change his mind, you know, once in a while. You know, people say only politicians change their mind. Well, I remember Patrick about, what was it, a year ago or something? In the summer of 99, he said, legislation, that's not a good course, you know. It's, we shouldn't legislate on, on this issue of uh, secession. We, we probably would be better off uh, uh, with a ministerial declaration or what, what, what what else? Uh, uh, a white paper. A white paper or something like that. And, and you know why Patrick was saying that? He says, well, we should not give the bloc the opportunity to, uh, to uh, you know, have all that time to debate uh, this, this bill, first reading, second reading, committee, third reading. But, you know, he can change his mind just like politicians because uh, he thinks legislation now is the, is the best course. Uh, so, and uh, I, I've debated with Stéphane Zion uh, two times this year in the university context in McGill in Montreal, and uh, it was some experience, I must admit. It was easier for me in, in, in Montreal, but uh, he had a very hard time there. But in McGill, it was, it was interesting. It was much more political than legal. And I, I'm sure Patrick will agree with that. Uh, in the House of Commons, the, the whole discussion on C20 was highly political. There were very few legal uh, debates in the House of Commons. Uh, I guess the nature of the bill itself and the, the, the opponents, the Liberals and the Bloc mainly, although the NDP and the Conservatives uh, made some points, the reformers were very quiet on Bill C-20. Uh, uh, but in the Senate, the, 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 the debate, the discussion has been very legal in its perspective, very constitutional in its perspective. Very interesting for, for lawyers like ourselves. Uh, I guess more interesting than in the House of Commons when it comes to, to law and consti constitutional law. But you know what? What has what strikes me in, in, in Bill C20, and that might be more legal than political. Although you know, I think it has some legal content. Is the idea that you know the federal principle, which was deemed to be so important by the Supreme Court in the Quebec secession reference, seems to me to have been uh, uh, emptied of its content by Bill C-20. And you know, I, I, I learned a really nice word in the English language. I love the English language. It's the most beautiful language. It's so nice that it imported 25,000 words from French. Uh, <laughs> that's why it has two, two times more words than than French has, it has 50,000 words, I understand. Uh, but listen to this, listen to what the court said uh, in the Quebec secession reference. In interpreting our constitution, the courts have always been concerned with the federalism principle, inherent in the structure of our constitutional arrangements, which has from the beginning been the lodestar. That's the word I like, the lodestar, by which the courts have been guided. So for me, Bill C-20, the Clarity Bill, when you link it with the Quebec secession reference, is something about shooting down the lodestar of Canadian federalism. Why? Well, my argument is twofold. To begin with, I believe that Bill C-20 gives extraordinary powers to the federal government. In fact, something equivalent to the disallowance powers that were given and provided uh, for in the Constitution, which have become, uh, how should I put, in abeyance, dormant, 
according to the Supreme Court itself. And I'll, I'll make my point on that. And also because I fundamentally believe, and we'll probably be in great disagreement on this, that this Bill C-20, rather than entrenching in a federal legislation the obligation to negotiate, really, in fact, entrenches an obligation not to negotiate, which I think is the main purpose of this bill. Maybe not the legal purpose of the bill, but the political purpose of the bill is to really give the federal government the tools in order for it not to negotiate, not to abide by its obligation to negotiate. So let me turn to my first, uh, first point. Disallowance powers in abeyance. According to the Supreme Court itself in the Quebec secession reference, Peter Hogg, I'm sure Patrick and other constitutional lawyers will agree with the fact that the, this, this allowance power does not exist or probably isn't, isn't in force anymore. But when you look at Bill C-20, what does it really do? When it provides the federal parliament with this legal tool, which is a determination, a determination by which the House of Commons can determine that a question is not clear or that a majority is not clear. Well, that is giving the House of Commons a power to disallow, one, a question put forward by a legislative assembly, you know, for example, the National Assembly of Quebec, and two, to disallow not only a question by a legislative assembly, but a decision or a view of the people of Quebec as a whole, if you give the power to the federal parliament, or to the House of Commons, I should be clear on that, to the House of Commons, to in fact disallow that decision in saying that it's not clear. And we do not know what clarity is when it comes to majority. So there is, in fact, when you, when you think about it, something like disallowance power. And although it's not formally, you know, the power of disallowance provided for in the, the, the BNA Act, well, it's very analogous to that. And, you know, under the sake of clarity and wanting clarity and before or after, uh, during the referendum, because, you know, there's something that also struck me the first time I read this bill. You know, what the Federal House of Commons is, is giving itself is the power to determine the clarity of the question during a referendum campaign. You know, we go on, we adopt a question in the National Assembly, then the referendum campaign starts, and in the middle of the campaign, well, you have the House of Commons deciding that this question is not clear. So what do we do? We stop the referendum. We stop, you know, even discussing the issue. All the people that started arguing during the referendum that people should vote no, including Senator Nolin, who brought that, that, uh, that uh, problem before the Senate. Well, just finish. It's, it's over. Well, you know, there's something inherently wrong in the idea of having the Federal House of Commons intervene during the process during which the debate on, on the future of Quebec is, is held. And Patrice Garin, our colleague from Université Laval, is also of that opinion. He, he wrote it. He said that again before the Senate committee last week. He believes that this is l'ingérence. It's, it's something that's totally unacceptable. But you know, I, I, I find that this is some, something that's totally unacceptable. It, 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 there's something wrong about the idea that the Federal House of Commons decide to overrule, in, in a sense, what the National Assembly has decided or seen as being a clear question, or the Quebec people itself deciding with a majority of 50% plus one that that wasn't clear. There's some, something of a very hierarchical view of, of federalism in, in that. And you know what 
what I think is even more unacceptable, where le bas blesse, we'd say in French, and that we brought it so often before the House of Commons, is that the House of Commons that will be doing that is composed of 226 MPs coming from outside Quebec. So if they want this question to be unclear, or they want this question or this result to be unclear, well, it's quite, it's quite easy. You know, you have a, a very significant majority to overrule a, a decision made by Quebecers or its National Assembly on, on clarity. And, you know, the reason why in many instances I've said that this process and even the bill itself lacks legitimacy is that among those members of the House of Commons, those 301 members of the House of Commons, when this bill, C20, came to a vote, no, there were 49 in Quebec that were against this. 49 were against this. So it's not a bill that has been approved by the MPs for Quebec. It does not have legitimacy when it comes to Quebec because it has been disapproved at a rate of 60% by the MPs for Quebec. So we might want to argue on this, but there's something that's really unacceptable when it comes to using this kind of tool to disallow something of a National Assembly of the people of Quebec. And tomorrow it might be Aboriginal peoples or other provinces, if other provinces uh, think that uh, secession is, uh, is the way for the future. So that's my, my, first, uh, my first point. My second point is about the obligation to negotiate, which is, uh, I think, the key element in the Supreme Court uh, reference, uh, a very surprising element. We, we mentioned that last year. There's, no one had you know, guessed that the, the court with, would create jurisprudentially this obligation to negotiate and use principles, and in this case, in specific case, use the federalism principle and the democratic principle to give rise to create a, an obligation to negotiate. And in paragraph 88, as you, as you remember, the federalism pr principles is, is invoked as the source of the obligation to negotiate. And, and later on in the paragraph, it, it is applied to Quebec. And uh, applied to Quebec, it, the court says that this the clear repudiation of, uh, of the existing constitutional order places an obligation on other provinces and the federal government to acknowledge and respect the expression, that expression of democratic will by entering into negotiations and conducting them in accordance with the underlying constitutional principles already discussed. Well, you know, when you read the bill, I, I really suggest that you read this bill carefully. I know Patrick has, has read it a hundred times, and Pierre, I'm sure, also has, has read, it, read it many times. Read it carefully. Because when it comes to negotiations, there's, it's, it's funny, there's a, there's a negative wording. The wording is negative. For example, paragraph 1-6, the government of Canada shall not enter into negotiations. Same thing for paragraph 2-4. The government of Canada shall not enter into negotiations. Well, three paragraph two. No minister of the Crown shall propose a constitutional amendment to effect the secession of the province, etc. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of sad to see the, the federal government wanting the obligation to negotiate and to give, give effect to the obligation of the, uh, to negotiate. That's the title of the act. And saying, in fact, well, these are the cases and instance where we will not negotiate. It's not very positive, you know? And, and that gives a sense of what this bill is all about, in fact. You know, you, you might want to think if this is good for the sake of clarity, you need to, to to legislate and create some criteria. But somewhere, even in the wording, you see the real purpose. I, I wouldn't dare say the pith and substance of this legislation, but the purpose, 
which is in fact to create a piece of legislation that provides with the, the government with the tools so that it does not need to negotiate, that it does not need to enter into negotiations. And if that wasn't enough, or if the language is not enough, well, you just have to look at all the people and the groups and the assemblies that need to be consulted if, if, uh, to determine if the question is clear or the majority is clear. Because you have a long list of, of, uh, of you know, groups that the House of Commons wants or needs to consult before making its own determination. You have the parties in the provincial parliament or legislature, uh, so you'd have to consult the Liberal Party in Quebec and uh, the, uh, the PQ and the Action Démocratique, but you'll also have to consult all the legislative assemblies in Canada and I think territorial assemblies as well. Uh, now you also have, because of, uh, of the NDP mainly, the Aboriginal peoples. And the senators now want to add to the list uh, linguistic minorities. That's a big debate in the Senate. Now some senators want linguistic minorities to be added to the list of those who have to be consulted before there is a determination on clarity. Well, you know, if you, and you know Meech, you know Charlottetown, how many people were involved in that and what happened to Meech and Charlottetown. Fortunately, the people were put uh, or given a, a, a right to, to decide on the fate of Charlottetown, which I think was much better than, than Meech. But when you get all these people and ask them what they think, there's probably one that will find there's something unclear about this, uh, this uh, question or about this, this uh, result. And that's also something we wanted to bring forward and, and show that this bill, in fact, multiplies the number of actors which will probably provide some good argument, a valid argument, not to enter into any kind of negotiations because the question will have been unclear or the majority will not have been seen uh, as clear. So that duty to consult, I, I, I think, is, is something that will pr allow the federal parliament, in fact, but you know who controls the federal parliament. You know, I experience that every day, you know, and, uh, I don't know if Patrick noticed, when we were studying Bill C-20, it was so, so disappointing. We, we saw how, how government worked and how our parliamentary system worked. You know, uh, Stéphane Dion's friends from the Privy Council were handing questions to those liberal MPs. You know, they were reading the questions that given to them. And it was all organized, all orchestrated, the same questions to the same witnesses, the witness that had been told beforehand what to say. There's even one MP, I remember, who handed an answer to one of the witnesses. So that was really something. And, and you know, in, in, in that kind of system, you worry about, you know, the relationship between the, the government and the House. Uh, and, you know, it, in this case, obviously, when the federal government will want, if, it, if that is the case, to see a question as unclear, a majority as unclear, it might not even have to do it itself. It could ask a province. It could ask a legislative assembly, a friendly legisl legislative assembly, or a friendly prime minister like Mr. Tobin, for example, in, in Newfoundland, who, he, who might want to find the question unclear or the majority unclear, or Aboriginal nations or linguistic minority. So, you know, there's something that really is, is, is disturbing in terms of, of uh, federalism and the federal principle because the obligation to negotiate, it seems to me, stem from that idea that a federation, especially the Canadian Federation, is a, is, is a consensual nature. And because if it's a consensual nature, you just have to negotiate if a, a people or a province wants to have its own way and decides that in a democratic uh, way. Well, that was my second point. Uh, let me conclude. Uh, I, uh, you know, it's not the first time that the Supreme Court suggests that federalism is important. In the patriation reference, it, uh, it confirmed that the principle of federalism runs through the political and legal systems. Uh, the Supreme Court cited Martlin and Ritchie in that reference saying that uh, 
Federalism is the dominant principle of Canadian constitutional law, a political and legal response to underlying and, uh, social and political realities. And, and I thought, I thought that the Supreme Court in the secession reference had breath life into the federalism principle. And you know, I, I'm talking as a student of federalism. I've always been interested, and I'm still interested in federalism and the way it binds the future of peoples together. Uh, it's not only the Canadian way and the, uh, the uh, American or Australian way which should be of interest. I, I, federalism is something that's, that's in progress in Europe. It doesn't mean that the European countries are, are not sovereign and federalism has not and does not necessarily mean that or suppose that sovereignties and even international sovereignties have to be sacrificed in the name of federalism. There's some kind of international federalism as well. But in, I guess, this parliament, this is very political and uh, very subjective. Uh, there's, there's, the liberal government is, is, does not have this federal perspective on things. And Bill C-20 is clearly something that does not really stick to the federal principle. It it's, creates a hierarchy between uh, the House and provincial assemblies. It, 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 it uh, empties of its substance the obligation to negotiate, I, I believe. And, you know, when I was a, a student of constitutional law, I remember very well, it was one of my favorite classes. I loved that class. My professor at the University of Sherbrooke would also always say, the king can do no wrong. Remember that? The king can do no wrong. And, you know, as a, a practicing, practicing politician, no? now I, I believe that in assenting the Clarity Bill, that might be a few days or a few weeks, a few months away, a liberal king governing at the center, governing from the center, should I say, will have done wrong, inflicted, I believe, irreparable damage on the Canada's federal polity he will have shot down the lodestar of Canadian federalism. Thank you. Well, as the chair, although Daniel is inviting me to reply by his constant reference to things I might have said, I'm going to restrain uh, myself and, uh, and not exercise uh, that uh, uh, role, but simply to say that we do have a few minutes if there are questions, I realize uh, we are late in the day, uh, but we do have, since we began at 1.45 until about 3.15, so if there are any questions from the floor. Yes. Yeah. A very legitimate question, and, and, and you know, uh, there were several suggestions made before the Legislative Committee in, in the House of Commons uh, by Mr. Ryan, for example. I, I tend to agree with Mr. Ryan, and he's not a Federalist, he's not a sovereign to say Mr. Ryan, the Liberal members of this committee were so surprised to hear him be very tough on Bill C-20. Mr. Ryan said, well, you know, you, you shouldn't meddle in this thing beforehand with legislation and determinations and because that's part of the process, it's part of the debate. Even the, the issue of clarity of the question is part of the debate in a referendum campaign. And some will vote no because the question is not clear in their opinion, not in the opinion of the MP for Toronto, Rosdale, or 
uh, someone from Saskatchewan or someone from Quebec, like myself, the, the MP for Wellness FA, because they think they, they have a good idea what's clear and is not. Maybe in 1995, a lot of people voted against you know, uh, sovereignty because they thought that question was not clear enough. But, you know, afterwards, Mr. Ryan and others, uh, Gordon Gibson, I think, suggested, well, maybe a determination could be made then. Maybe Parliament can have a role then. Or maybe Parliament as a whole should have a role then, even including the Senate in some kind of Congress. And, and to adopt a constitutional amendment and not looking at the formulas of 750 or, or the unanimity, which would again be formulas that would allow one province to prevent you know, the democratic accession of Quebec to sovereignty. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that should be imagined and thought of in the rest of Canada to deal with the issue. And, and if you want my opinion, I'd rather have a lot of people dealing more, more with the plan A than plan B because that's the way you could, I think, uh, get Quebecers to believe more in Canada than, than they believe now or that they, they, they stop believing in. Bill C-20, you know, does not have support in Quebec. Stéphane might come here soften and uh, more and more often to tell you you know, Quebecers are in agreement with the content of the bill. They might not be in agreement with the idea. That's not true. In the National Assembly, three parties are against this bill. In the House of Commons, 49 MPs from Quebec out of 75, only Liberals are for this bill. And the civil society in Quebec, and you know the importance of civil society here in Toronto and the strength of civil society, students, trade unions, women groups, uh, you name it they're against this bill. There's a big consensus against this bill. It will not help to promote national unity. And that's why I feel, I, I feel that, you know, believing that there should be a, a good debate between the two options, you know, renewed federalism and sovereignty and partnership, this, why, this is why this kind of bill upsets me so much. It doesn't help anyone. It's bad for Canada, bad for Quebec, it's r bad for democracy. Uh, I think we have one more question. Time for one more. Neil? Professor Turf, if I understand your, one of your principal theses, it's that the House of Commons is overruling or disallowing the question of the National Assembly if it decides the question is unclear. As I understand it, the consequence Maybe I'll just repeat that for those of you who might not have heard it. Neil's basically saying if the only consequence of a determination by the House of Commons is to prevent the Government of Canada from negotiating, why does that amount to overruling the Quebec uh, National Assembly's determination of the question? Daniel? Well, you know, even if the consequence is that the Government shall not enter into negotiation, that's the legal consequence of that. In, in fact, you have two bodies that are making a determination on the same thing. The National Assembly makes a determination on the clarity of the question and adopting the question, and the House of Commons makes a determination on the clarity of the question. Well, you know, the future of Quebec, I always believe, should be in the hands of Quebecers. And the decision should be made by Quebecers. And the decision on the clarity of the question should be made by Quebecers, and the decision on what kind of question to draft should be made by Quebecers. If you do give the House of Commons, you know, a, a, a power to decide on the clarity, you do give to the rest of Canada that power. Well, no, it's not fair to me, and it's not fair to Quebecers. Yeah.
Well, no, I don't think it's consistent with federalism because I, the federalism I believe in is a federalism where there is autonomy in determining what your future is. And if another house can influence and unduly influence on that, I think that's not consistent with federalism. I, I believe it's, it's an unduly influence to determine that a question asked by the National Assembly is unclear, especially when it's done before and in the middle of a campaign, because then it's very political. It's not legal, it's political. It's part of the arsenal of means to convince Quebecers to vote no. That's what it's all about. That's really the argument. The argument is that now that you've been told that the question is unclear and there won't be any negotiations, vote no. That is the real political consequence. Pierre, did you want to comment? Well, I just wanted to say that <clears throat> in your argument that the bill <clears throat> resurrects the disallowance power, in your argument that it uh, entrenches an obligation not to negotiate, or indeed in your postulate that the uh, federal government or the other political actors, you spoke of the majority of non-Quebecers in the House of Commons, would seek to frustrate uh, the government's obligation to negotiate. It seems to me that you uh, have not commented on the court's express uh, mention that the compliance with the ruling or compliance with domestic law, which includes the ruling, would be supervised by the international community. And quite often, uh, uh, sovereignists uh, make that point. So I think that it's, uh, I find those arguments unconvincing because there will always be that uh, uh, supervising uh, uh, authority of the international community to say nothing of um, past practice in Canada. After all, Canada is the country that has produced a ruling by its highest court saying that it is divisible. Hmm? Well, you know, I, 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 I find the, the ruling very interesting myself, and I think many sovereigns find it, not only because it, it, uh, it confirms many of our arguments and many of the, of, the, uh, of the way we've implemented our own agenda for some, how we done that and suggesting that there, there would be negotiations and but not negotiations to the extent where the, if they don't work we don't do nothing you know and the court says uh, and I talked about this year last year that uh, we might look at to the international community if there's negotiations in bad faith or they they stumble but you know I, I, I still maybe legally you know, certainly a court and the Supreme Court will not say this is a power of disallowance. It's not uh, Article 51, 90, it, it might easily say that this is not unconstitutional. Uh, there are arguments, especially the arguments of Patrice Garin about uh, constitutional impre imprecision for the, the uh, clause on the clarity of the majority there might be a good case to declare that clause or the bill as a whole because of that unconstitutional. And you know, there might be a case brought before some groups in Quebec against Bill C-20. Some people are thinking of bringing it to court and asking courts to declare it unconstitutional. Uh, but having said all that, the, the focus of this bill is, is, is certainly not on legality. I, I don't believe it really is consistent with the, with the ruling of the, 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 the Supreme Court. In fact, to be consistent with the ruling of the Supreme Court, in my opinion, the government should have left it there. That's almost what the court was telling the government. It's almost what Monsieur Lamaire, in an interview in Le Devoir, told people at the end of his mandate or just before he left. He, he almost said, he didn't dare say that. but. He almost said, you know, the way to comply to this ruling is to let it, let the ruling be the guiding principle or the guiding uh, instrument in the future debates on the, on the, on the uh, future of Quebec and Canada. And that's why it's very frustrating, I must admit, very frustrating as a parliamentarian uh, 
to have to legislate on these matters because I don't think it's the role of a, of a, of a House to legislate these matters. We have referendums to debate these issues. And I don't believe that Canadians have been deprived from their capacity to come and debate in Quebec if they want Quebec to stay in Canada. They can, they have, and uh, I welcome people to come and debate in Quebec on these issues. Well, uh, let me uh, thank uh, on your behalf our two guests uh, from Montreal who have uh, uh, come here and uh, today and assisted us uh, in our uh, discussions. And as you will see, although in Toronto uh, we do not typically today hear a lot of discussion about this issue, it is still very much uh, alive uh, in the province of Quebec and is certainly a topic of active debate. Let me thank all of you as well on behalf of the Law Society for uh, attending uh, these special lectures over the last two days. I think we have had a very good discussion and we are looking forward, of course, to the publication of the book of the papers, which I think will add uh, to our understanding of constitutional and administrative law. Thank you very much. Patrick, did you say I